I want to thank our sponsor, Planet Forward. Planet Forward has always been a proud supporter of law enforcement in the community, providing customer service and fleet management, sales and service. If you're looking for that personal quality service, contact Planet Forward in Spring or online at planetforward.com. You're listening to Crime Scene Today. I'm your host, Dan Zentek. We cover current and future issues affecting law enforcement, uh, forensics, and crime scene investigations. Uh, today, we sort of have a different uh, show for you. Uh, normally, we have some subject matter experts in crime scene and forensics, and we also uh, talk about maybe some case studies and such. But something that's happening around the nation currently is all of our local elections. And one thing that uh, it's actually pretty sad is that uh, out of all the registered voters that we have, how few actually turn out. And what's even more concerning than that is how few of those registered voters actually are educated and informed voters. And even though the election that we may be talking about today doesn't affect your area, what I certainly encourage everyone to do is become an informed voter and actually uh, find your candidates, have conversation with your candidates. Uh, and speaking with most candidates, the one thing that I've learned is that most of them are willing to talk to you. They'll tell you their values. They'll tell you uh, answers to the questions that are important to you and having them as an elected official. And at the end of it, if you agree with them, they'd love your vote. And if you don't, then at least they've had the opportunity to share that information with you. So today we're going to be talking about uh, in Montgomery County, we have a precinct two constable race. And currently uh, we have Constable Gene DeForest, who is elected in that current position, has been there for many years. Uh, Gene, thank you for coming in today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate you. So uh, before we sort of get started, just about you and things, um, as far as Precinct 2, uh, our county is divided into five precincts. That's and, correct. Uh, and your population of your precinct um, is sort of divided equally. That's how it's divided is uh, you have about 90,000 people or so. Probably so, close to there, right around there somewhere. So, and um, last saw it was about 123 square miles, and uh, you are responsible for uh, that area of the county. Now, the one unique part of your area, unlike some of the other areas, is you have a high concentration of the county seat, which is the city limits of Conroe. That's correct. So, um, you, and, and correct me on some of these numbers I have, but as far as uh, uh, commissioned officers, you have about 14? That's correct. Okay, and I know just uh, last year you, you added another uh, in that, so I guess they gave you another at commissioner's court. Uh, so uh, so around there, about 14 or so. Um, you've been in the job how long now? I've been the constable for Montgomery County for a little over 19 years. I've uh, been in law enforcement a little over 45 years. Um, did give a little interest on myself. I'm married to my wife for a little over 45 years. I have a daughter and two beautiful granddaughters, which uh, I'm very proud of and, and uh, love doing things with them. Um, as a law enforcement officer, I've, uh, I've been a supervisor. Uh, I've been a supervisor in the oil field. I've supervised a number of people, and I've been a leader for Montgomery County and Precinct 2 for the last 19 plus years. Obviously, a big question, 40 years in, now one benefit of being in law enforcement that all of us uh, enjoy is the retirement system that we get, right? I mean, that's uh, we put in a lot of hours, and there's a lot of sacrifices made in law enforcement. As a matter of fact, today is Law Enforcement Appreciation Day, and, and yes. we know the sacrifices that are made by law enforcement out there and, and the things that our families give up for the time that we put in and such. Um, and it's usually so we retire a little bit early on and enjoy that time and family. So a question for you after 40 years, uh, why at this point uh, would you not want to retire? Well, I enjoy my job. Uh, that's one thing about uh, being the constable. Um, I enjoy doing things with the community. I enjoy doing things for the community, for the people, uh, not only in Precinct 2, but for Montgomery County as a whole and people in Texas that come through Montgomery County. I enjoy helping anybody that I can and doing things for children. Um, I just love uh, being that part of the job. So as far as the, the constable's office now, uh, obviously uh, the Texas Constitution says the constable will serve civil process. That is, that's the main function uh, as per the Constitution that that's is correct. mandated that you have to do. And that uh, you have how many people assigned to that currently? Well, well, my office staff is broke down as I have a, a chief deputy who runs the office. I have a captain who takes care of all the training and, and other uh, assignments throughout in the office. 
and I have a, a lieutenant that handles all my specialty writs, uh, which keeps him very busy. And then I have a sergeant uh, that takes care of my patrol on the evening shift. So I have uh, about four civil deputies, um, three during the daytime plus a bailiff, and then I have one in the evening that does civil process, taking care of the civil duties that we can't get done during the day. So now you said you have some on evenings, you have some on days, and I know that in recent years you've uh, received some criticism as, as not having a 24-7 department, right? That's correct. Um, and, and obviously uh, as the elected official, as the person over that, it, it's up to you to decide when you have enough resources to, to have that available. Uh, what do you feel would be needed for your department to be 24-7, sort of answer those criticisms you've received? Well, if uh, Commissioner's Court uh, would uh, break loose with about another 20 deputies, I could do a 24-7 operation. Like we uh, talked about earlier, you know, our main process is civil, and we're mandated by law, like I said, through the Texas Constitution, to get those civil papers served. And that's our main function. Um, to do the, the other stuff, uh, the, we do some patrol, uh, it's the Sheriff's Department responsibility in Montgomery County to take care of the unincorporated areas, and it's the city responsibility to take care of the uh, city responsibilities. It's not our responsibility to go out here and, and uh, do that work, but, you know, we do. We, we do what we can to help out, and, and we're there for the, to back up the Sheriff's Department. We're there to back up Conroe Police Department. I work very close with all the law enforcement agencies around here. And outside um, Montgomery County, outside Texas, you know. Now, as far as, you know, you had said that the sheriff is, is responsible for the unincorporated areas and such. But, um, you know, something that, uh, again, uh, some of the constable stuff been challenged on is that now, per the Constitution, as you said, that the, the state requires uh, the constable serve civil process. But and just the same as with the sheriff, it says he will take care of the jail. Uh, and then beyond that, both are peace officers. And at that point, it really is sort of a designation, I guess, by county to county. Because if you look at Harris County, Montgomery County, uh, the Sheriff's Department plays a huge part in the law enforcement function of that county. Uh, once you leave Montgomery County, you start heading to other places in West Texas or whatever, the sheriff takes care of the jail, and DPS is on the street, and there's a city who's taking care of those functions and such. So uh, it does, again, sort of fall back to uh, the community on, on what's available to be done. I know that... Um, you uh, or your, some of your deputies have worked in uh, rear plantation as sort of an extra patrol to provide extra uh, enforcement there. Yes, sir. Um, in other constable agencies, they have, uh, or even the Sheriff's Department, they've elected to uh, do a contract program. Uh, have you considered that, or has that ever been on <clears throat> the plate for y'all? I have. Uh, I talked to River Plantation uh, several years ago about doing a contract with them. However, a contract uh, deputy... Um, is very expensive. It uh, is. They have to. They have to, now. They have to provide everything. They have to buy, provide the car, the insurance. They have to uh, provide all the retirement. The same thing that uh, that the county provides for one deputy. They have to provide for right. The equipment on the car. Everything. The equipment. Right. Everything. The fuel. The maintenance is all taken care of by that uh, that uh, subdivision, wherever it may be. Now, can River Plantation can, can afford that? No, they can't. Uh, they get forty. 40 hours a week, uh, you know, with the deputies right now, and we arrange the, they arrange the hours in which they want us to work, and I have deputies down there that do that. And uh, they are strictly in River Plantation unless uh, a sheriff's department call drops outside where assistance is needed or if they don't have a, uh, an available deputy, you know, the guy in River Plantation, up he's close to it, he'll answer the call. And just so I understand, as far as your patrol division, you had said back, backing up the Sheriff's Department on calls, um, I would also assume that your deputies, the ones that are assigned to patrol functions, do they directly answer calls? I mean, if, if a call is dropped in the Sheriff's District or, or otherwise, do they go and become primary and they handle the call or do they always back up? Oh, no, they, uh, they do answer calls uh, and they do take primary positions sometimes. Um, again, if, if uh, a lot of times, you know, the Sheriff's Department, they're, they're tied up, they're busy, they're, they can't sure, get away. Right. So, you know, we got uh, officers out there on the street, yes, we take on, take on the calls and, 
and work them and become the, uh, the major unit in, involved into it. Yeah. Now, one of the things I know that you have, or at least did have, correct me if it's changed, but you have a, a map truck I also. Do. Okay, so, and that provides another service to the citizens. The map guy, he runs the freeway uh, sometimes from county line to county line. Uh, we help, you know, hundreds of people off the freeway a year. Uh, you know, for their safety. And there was something that was uh, uh, started by Commissioner Air Chance a number of years ago, and uh, I got involved into it. And uh, thanks to commissioners and uh, Buckaloo Chevrolet uh, providing a vehicle for us, we were able to get involved and, and help out on the freeways. And it's a big deal. It's, uh, it takes, uh, uh, takes a lot off uh, of people as far as, you know, coming into Montgomery County or traveling through Montgomery County. If they break down with a flat tire or run out of gas or break down for some other reason, we do what we need to do to get them off the freeway to keep them safe. You know, one question has come up. I know that uh, you've been asked during uh, this election as far as would you change anything and such, and, and someone has said that your answer is that you would change nothing. Uh, but uh, I guess I would challenge that with law enforcement changing all the time, what, what do you see the future needs of, of Precinct 2 or law enforcement to the Precinct 2 community being? Well, you know, I do have an ICAT detective um, that works for Internet Crimes Against Children. I'm very proud of uh, that position, uh, along with Brett Ligon. Uh, that's where uh, she works out of and does an excellent job over there, uh, getting our predators off the street to keep our children safe. Um, what I'd like to see is, uh, yeah, maybe we could get, a, you know, a couple more patrol deputies as time goes on. Um, I do, do what we have to do here in Montgomery County. Um, I have half the deputies that other constables have, and we still do about the same amount of work that everybody else does. So we do a great job, and I'd, I'd like to continue that. I'd like to, to see a little bit more help uh, to help the people on the street, uh, to help the community, to keep, to keep the community safe. I like community policing. I've, I've started that when I took office day one to have our officers go through the subdivisions, to drive in the subdivisions, to stop to talk to people and visit with people and, and be seen. Uh, I think it's a big, big plus. Now, as some of the other constables, and uh, we'll see examples, uh, Precinct 1 does the lake and they have the mental health, and at Precinct 3, uh, they have the DWI unit and uh, uh, computer forensics. And, and basically, there were needs in the county that they felt uh, needed to be addressed. Do you see and with with four and five, it seems to be the narcotics in the area that they seem to, to focus on outside of that. Do you see a need in Precinct 2 that you feel needs to grow or be addressed outside of the norm? Well, I have a narcotics officer, a detective that, uh, that works very close with Conroe Police Department, the DEA, the feds. Uh, we make a number of cases uh, every, every year, uh, bringing in money uh, to our department, uh, to the DA's office, and you know, we've got money uh, with the federal government right now that we're waiting to, to obtain to get released. And, of course, it, you know, with the feds, it just takes a while for, for things to go through the process. Um, I, w I would like to get another detective for, for, for narcotics. I would like to uh, see us get another detective for uh, crimes, uh, Internet Crimes Against Children, ICAT. I uh, would like to see us get a detective to where we could handle, uh, you know, cases within our department, within our precinct, uh, where the sheriff's department doesn't have to handle all that. Um, again, you know, our civil process is number one. I would like to have a couple more civil deputies for civil process to help get that taken care of. I know one of them has brought up that we are, you know, we don't do warrants. Uh, about four years ago, uh, all the JPs and, and the district attorney had gotten together and, and they dismissed everything that was 10 years and older. Right. Right. Now, all the warrants didn't get dismissed. Some of them, you know, are being paid on. Some of them are, are in adjudication. Um, some of them are out there. But also, at that time, what happened, what come forth was net data. Net data is a system that is connected to all the JPs. One, two, four, and five. Three didn't get involved in it at the time. And uh, we, uh, we have them on board, and they... When a fine comes out of the JP's office, they're contacted immediately. They're in the system. Um, when the fine's not paid, the, uh, the people are contacted by NetData. NetData uh, is a collection uh, service, basically. Collection agency, right. yes. They're contacted by phone and by letter. And uh, if it go, it's going to go to a warrant, uh, they also contact them again by letter and by phone. And once it goes to a warrant, 
they're contacted once again by phone and, and by letter to let them know that a warrant has been issued for their arrest. Now, if they don't take care of it, then a warrant is uh, sent over to the Sheriff's Department, put in the system, and uh, it's worked you know, accordingly. Do I have a warrant officer that actually sets down and, and does warrants? No, I don't. Um, you know, you got the net data that's done all this. They've contacted these people not once, not twice, probably four or five times in writing and by phone to help get this collected. A lot of these warrants that uh, are probably out of county and as a law enforcement officer, you can't go outside the county to have people extradited back to Montgomery County unless it's a neighboring county. Uh, if somebody has a warrant out of Dallas, you can't go pick them up right. without extradition. And Montgomery County is not going to do an extradition because it's too expensive. There's no, there's no profit out of it. Right. Now, Constable, I know you, you had made the comment uh, when I'd asked you to come in. I appreciate you, you coming in to talk to us that uh, you want an opportunity. I certainly want you to have the opportunity that during the course of you going to a couple of different events and, and having the opportunity to talk such that uh, you have had uh, one of the other cancer race make accusations or uh, at least make claims that you believe against your department are inaccurate. And I just want to give you the chance to, to clear up if, if there's something that's out there that someone may have heard and, and what is the truth on it. Well, one of the, uh, one of the candidates had made claim that we only serve 21% of our civil papers, which right. is not true. All of our civil papers are served. There, in 19 years, I can tell you that I have never had one complaint that we have not served the civil papers that need to be served. The, um, I talked to my, one of my girls at the office the other, uh, before I came over here, and she told me that one of, the, one of them had sent a uh, open records request and as an open records request comes in, if whatever it's whatever they ask for in the open records request, that's what we have to give. We sure, can't right. give more or less. We have to give exactly what they've asked for. And if they don't ask for the proper stuff, we can't we can't give it. It's right. against we, the law for us to do. We don't guess at what they're needing. We only right. put what they've asked for. So when they ask for uh, how many uh, civil papers you have received and how many have you served, there's a big difference there because some of the civil papers that come to our office, some of them we send back for a rule, some of them we send um, to be posted, some of them we go out here and we try to serve and, and either the people are, are not available, they're not, uh, they don't live there no more, they've moved, uh, the address is wrong, and we don't search, do research to find an address anymore. It doesn't mean that there hasn't been some type of activity on each paper. That is absolutely correct. Received. It just means these numbers are not yeah. going to be equal to. That one is another. absolutely correct. We have sent it back to the courts, and they've been they either been returned to the court unserved uh, because of whatever the circumstances may be, or to go and to go back to the court to get a rule to to be able to either post it on the door or give it to somebody else that may be at the the, the house. Whatever the judge. Uh, deems fit for us to do. Do you believe there's anything else that's been said that's, that's inaccurate you'd like to address? Yeah, they said that uh, uh, I have neglected to give a bailiff uh, to the court from times, and I have in 19 plus years never, never have I ever not provided a bailiff for the court. In 2018, commissioners had finally given me a bailiff uh, after asking over the number of years uh, for a bailiff, but uh, in 2018, they gave me a bailiff uh, for the position of doing just the bailiff duties. Now, on top of the bailiff duties that uh, that we provide, he has other, other you know, duties that he has to perform when he comes back to the office. Uh, he just don't go over to the JP's office and just sit there all day long doing nothing. Unless there's court going on, then he provides like, the bailiff his service. Court, if they're having court, he's there. Uh, and it's always been that way. If he has court over there, even back before I had a bailiff, I'd pull one of my deputies off the street and I'd go over there and do bailiff duties. And now that I have the bailiff, he, he does them. Now, if he's not, not, not in the office or he has taken off or he's gone on vacation for a couple of weeks, then I still provide a bailiff to him. I right. pull somebody off the street and I go over there and do bailiff duties. Um, but then, like I said, in 2018, the commissioner's court finally gave me a bailiff and um, when he's not in court doing the bailiff duties, he has civil duties he has to do. He, he performs civil process duties that, uh, that are in our office. I don't have time to have somebody sit 
and get on the phone to try to serve warrants. I've done that with, uh, with some of my guys that uh, were on light duty. Instead of them sitting around the office doing nothing, I put them up there on the phone and you right. know, making phone calls. And, um, but like I say, you know, net data has already contacted these people, you know, five, six, you know, however many times that they contact them even after warrants been issued. So that, is what me, you're saying is that they, they've been con at this point, they just need to, you need to go pick them up. I mean, yeah. at this point they have the notice. So, and I can tell you that in 19 years, I have never had a complaint. I've never had a blemish on my office on me or anybody in my office or file with the uh, county attorney's office to file suit against Montgomery County. That has never happened. So, well, it um, sounds it sounds like you have a lot of things that you you feel need to be done. You you accept that uh, the department uh, should grow and there should be some other things that that are being done. Um, but at this point, you don't feel you have enough resources to accomplish some of those. And, and until you have those resources, you have other priorities. That's right. Um, we have to, number, we do, we take care of the people in, in Precinct 2 in Montgomery County. Um, and we do a great job of it. I have a great office staff. They do a wonderful job. Uh, one of the old sayings is you can't be a great leader without great people to lead. That's definitely and, true. And I feel that, that uh I don't want to pat myself on the back because that's not true. I shouldn't shouldn't do that. But the people that work for the Precinct 2 Constable's Office, they're the ones I pat on the back because they're the ones that go out there and do their job. They're the ones that go out there and get these papers paper served. They're the ones that go out and take care of uh, the business at hand. They're the ones that go out and visit with people. They're the ones that go out. If we have a warrant for somebody, they search them down and, and find them and, and put them in jail. Um, and we serve, you know, we serve felony warrants all the time. I do have one now that I've hired that likes DWIs, so he goes out and works a DWI deal. New Year's Eve, we did the DWI task force. Uh, I'm not sure what the reason was, but I'm glad to see that there there wasn't a lot of DWIs out there on the road this year. Uh, well, I know we picked up two of them. Hopefully we made an impact. I yes, know I hope so we did. So, well, in, in wrapping up, we uh, are wrapping up to, to go to the next candidate, but I certainly want to give uh, you a moment uh, what you would like uh, the people to leave with, just sort of your, your ending message on what, uh, what you feel is the most important thing to tell them. I'm Gene DeForest. I'm your constable for Precinct 2. I've run on the, uh, the one thing is that I'm the people's choice. I've been the people's choice since day one. When I came into office, I made the foundation of the Precinct 2 constable's office on professionalism, pride, honesty, and integrity. I hold everybody accountable to that. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of everything that uh, the, uh, the people that work for the Precinct 2 and work for you, the people, do. And that's what I do. I work for you, the voters, the people that have put me in office, the people that live in Precinct 2. I don't work for anybody else. I work for you, and I'm proud of that, and I'm honored to have this job to serve you, and I look forward to serving you for another four years after the election. Well, Constable, and I thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for coming by today, and we appreciate it. just getting to know you a little bit better and knowing your department. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Don't miss Lone Star Community Radio on TV and YouTube. Our talk show and music shows are featured on Our City TV, Sudden Link Channel 12, and have their own YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe to keep up with posted shows and comment on them below the video. Did you know there are more than 790 abused and neglected children currently in foster care in Montgomery County? Will you help make a difference? I'm Allie Stevens with Costa Child Advocates of Montgomery County. We train and support volunteers to be the voice of children in the foster care system. Kids removed from their home because of abuse and neglect. And we need volunteers just like you to advocate for these children. To learn more about becoming an advocate, please visit costaspeaksforkids.com. That's costaspeaksforkids.com. This is Rick, TRC. Every Tuesday on my show, Afternoons with Lone Star, from 3 to 7, I play back-to-back -back classic rock hits. That's right. I like to call it a two-for Tuesday or a three-for whatever it is you'd like. Call the request line, 936-647-3776, or message me on Facebook, Afternoons with Lone Star, make a music request. That's right, you can do it. 
here's what else. Go over to our website, IRLoneStar.com. Get the app on your phone. It's easy. You'll like it. Our talk shows and music shows are looking for sponsors. Want to expand your brand awareness? Reach the hyper-local audience in Montgomery County? Lone Star Community Radio sponsorships accomplish this. Want to see our stats and rates? Check out IRLoneStar.com slash sponsor for more information. Or call in and leave us a message at 936-647-3776. Statistics show that one out of every six Texans struggles with food insecurity and hunger. And many people don't eat enough fruits and vegetables every day. The Better Living for Texans program is here to help you learn how to make healthy menu choices, save money at the grocery store, prepare quick and delicious meals, get more good nutrition in your day, and get more physical activity. Classes are fun, friendly, interactive, and free, and taught in English and Spanish. We are Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, helping Texans make their lives better. You're listening to Crime Scene today. We're back with uh, Daniel Pena, who is a candidate in the Precinct 2 Constable race. Uh, we've just finished speaking to the uh, elected constable and uh, to get all the candidates in here just to give the voters an informed decision to meet the candidates and have a, a conversation with them. Daniel, thank you for coming and, and joining us today. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Daniel, a little bit uh, that I know, I've known you for a little bit. Uh, currently, you're at the Sheriff's Department. Correct. Uh, and uh, deputy, or you have different ranks? It's a specialist. Okay. Yes, sir. And uh, I know that in the past you worked on uh, warrants and SWAT and those type of things. Uh, what are some of uh, the other areas in law enforcement that, that you've been? Well, I started my career in Chambers County as a reserve deputy. Then I came to Montgomery County and worked in the jail for a short time. After that, got transferred to patrol and then spent a couple years in patrol. Took a two-year break, went overseas to do private security in Iraq uh, with the Department of State. Came back, short time on patrol again, then been on SWAT for the last 10 years. And so, obviously, uh, a big question would be, you know, and I know you've been asked this numerous times is why, but I'm, I'm more curious, uh, instead, of, instead of the general why and serving the people that we've, we've done since the beginning, right? That's Correct. why uh, we were paramedics. That's why we were police. It's just what we do, Correct. right? Yes, sir. So the bigger question, I guess, would be is uh, what issues do you feel are in precinct two that you as constable could address or could make better? Well, one being is... Um, like the constable mentioned earlier, not having a detective that works cases. I feel that, yes, it's a small agency with 14 uh, sworn officers, but I think planning and uh, preparation could get those officers to work in a wide variety of areas. You know, on the SWAT team, we serve warrants. We're task force officers with the U.S. Marshals. So we have a lot of duties, not only SWAT duties, but running felony warrants, uh, teaching active shooter courses, bunch of different other community outreach stuff. So I think uh, getting a detective there focused on just precinct two cases, as well as uh, increasing the community outreach that the county, the sheriff's office already does. Now, the constable had, I mean, he's a 14-person department, and uh, as uh, we talked, I mean, he's received some criticism that he's the only constable agency currently that's not 24-7. Correct. Uh, he believes he would need an extra 20 people to accomplish this goal. Uh, do you believe that that many are necessary? Do you believe that that's a goal that, that needs to be accomplished? I mean, 20 officers, I don't think anybody would say no to 20 officers, 20 deputies. Uh, I don't think that's what's needed. I just think with better planning and uh, better scheduling. And, uh, of course, course is going to take some, um, some uh, work, uh, hard work by the other deputies that are already there as well to implement this, but I don't think 20 officers are needed. But yes, making it a 24-hour agency would be one of the one of the main goals. So as I, as I talked to him about Precinct 1, uh, taking care of mental health and Lake and, and Precinct 3 with our crimes against children and forensic um, computer analysis, DWI, 4 and 5, handling narcotics, it appears that, that all constables at some point have looked at the county and said that there is an issue that needs to be addressed more in their area. And it's the one thing that I, I really enjoy about uh, the constables is that they, they are to a specific area. It is a specific precinct. It, it is a solid community <coughs> policing because it is that community. Right. It's not a, a countywide thing. So what in precinct two that you see needs to be addressed that you feel 
uh, would be an important addition uh, to the constable agency. Well, one being is I've had some voters reach out to me, and they've told me about certain areas that they live in that are heavy with drugs. So increasing narcotics officers, maybe additional canine officers out there, or canine capable officers out there to fight the, uh, the drug problem. Another issue would be, like I said earlier, community outreach. I know active shooter is, is hot in the news, you know, with all the, all the on, going on in the country and in the state, but that would be another one that I would really focus on is doing a community outreach for the greater Conroe area, because ma- ma- out east towards Crockett and Martin area in the precinct, a lot of those places feel forgotten. I talk to voters and they're telling me that they've never seen some of our constables, some of our deputies. It's not because our deputies aren't out there, it's just there's not enough out there. So uh, focusing on community outreach type stuff like that. Now, a, a couple things I, I really won't say you've been criticized over, but uh, have acknowledged that are probably weaker areas that I'd like you to address is uh, you have not had a role in which you've served civil process uh, you have not been over uh, a civil type thing. So this would be an area you'd have to learn, Correct. right? And then, uh, and, and please correct me if, if I've missed it, but through your law enforcement career, have you been in a supervisory rank uh, over a thing? Because you obviously would be the elected. You're now over budget. You're over people and hiring, firing, and policies and those type of things. Um, not being over those in the past, how do you feel that you'd be able to overcome those? Do you have to have that experience going in? Do you feel you can just get it when you're there? What's your thoughts? Well, I haven't had a supervisory title as a sheriff's deputy. I have been a supervisor prior as an operations and medical supervisor for a pharmaceutical company where I ran the daily operations, hiring, firing, and not just that, but taking care of the medical issues of some of our donors. So I I have had supervisory experience. Uh, Currently, I'm uh, in the State Guard as a warrant officer which I'm over operations and training for the company and the battalion level over the dive and maritime team. So I do have supervisor experience, okay. not necessarily in law enforcement. And the reason being is I love SWAT. I've been there 15 years and many people, once they get there, that's where they want to stay. And I've loved what I do. I get to serve warrants, help people, not just in certain areas, the entire county. Uh, so I've been a team leader there and it's not technically a supervisor position or rank, but I do supervise officers. I'm the dignitary lead for our dignitary protection, which 25 of our deputies are, are trained in, certified in, and so a large uh, detail were to come in, I'm gonna be in charge of it. So I do have supervisor experience. Traditional rank, no, but that was my choice because like I said, I've loved being on SWAT. I still love being on SWAT, and that's what I chose to be. Many have come and gone, and I've decided to stay where I'm at because I love my job. So what about the civil side? How do you plan to address that? Well, the civil side, uh, I'm a quick learner. I I have several degrees, been a paramedic, firefighter, uh, got my undergrad in Homeland Security. I got my master's degree in security management. I'm working on a cybersecurity degree now. So I'm a quick learner. Uh, I feel that if I dedicate some time, and people ask me about time, do I have time for this? Yes, I'll have time for this. Um, I'll make time for it to learn the process in the civil process. I'm a quick learner. I'm hands-on. And like I said, I mean, my training and education will show you that I, I've i quick learner. Now, one of the um, things that I'd, I'd ask the constable is uh, it's unique in Precinct 2 that a large portion of your area is incorporated mm-hmm. where a lot of the other areas are not. So you have a large portion uh, that is the city of Conroe. And so it, it has been questioned that in the other unincorporated areas that when – we're providing more deputies and we're providing these services these that they're needed because it's unincorporated um, so how do you feel that that need is there uh, to address or what's your plan in working with conroe pd or or does conroe take care of their area and there's a small portion you're taking care of how's that work well i mean i've worked closely with a bunch of different agencies and my different capacities from my work experience and with law enforcement so obviously a dialogue would have to be open, see what's needed, what we need to focus on. But like I said before, you know, the, the county's growing. It, it's growing leaps and bounds. 2017, Conroe was the fastest growing city in the country. So it's growing leaps and bounds. I don't think we could have enough officer, officers out there. Uh, public safety is paramount. It's always been to me. So working alongside of these agencies, determining where these officers could better be used and focus on would be de- detrimental for for the county It'd be, i mean they're going to benefit from it so now uh they talked about the 
the amount of civil process and needing more to even handle that. So uh, let's say that you go to commissioner's court, and right now you have 14, and, and as, as we've seen, it's, it's sort of hit or miss, right? You, you may get a position, you may get three. There's been some years we got five, right? right? Um, what if you get none? You know, so it's sort of, we'd love to grow. That's always an option. Um, what about uh, contract policing? That's how, obviously, Precinct 5, that's they contract with Magnolia ISD. Uh, they have officers from there at uh, Sheriff's Park. One of the largest contracts in the county is the Woodlands. Uh, that's contract policing. And then, obviously, uh, uh, Precinct 3 has theirs. So have you looked into or, or uh, your thoughts on growing through contracts? I mean, it's, that's really going to determine or be determined by the subdivision because like the constable said earlier they're going to have to flip the bill for the entire contract so i'm not against it i'm not opposed to it if that's what they want to do and they're willing to do that then yes let's do it i mean more officers the the that subdivision that area would benefit from it so yeah i'm the if that's if that's an option then i'd say go for it so what about uh, uh grant programs i don't know if there's any currently being used in precinct two but like there's a step programs there's other things like that um I guess just in general, what what is your plan to address the things you want to address with the limited resources that, that pretty much seem to be there? Well, I've taken several classes through FEMA from a critical infrastructure, infrastructure protection, and one of the things, one of the classes we took was they they educated us on the different grant programs that are out there, uh, not just the STEP. There's other ones to help build infrastructure. As long as it's it's functional, like terrorism, it's got if it's connected to terrorism, there's certain grants we could apply for. Uh, there's grants to update equipment. There's a bunch of grants out there that, that could be used. I just don't feel that Precinct 2 Constables has taken advantage of it. You know, even, you could see with the, the flooding river plantation, um, it was a very slow process. I've, I focus on disaster recovery. That's what my undergrad was in. I've volunteered with different organizations nationwide to help areas recover from disaster. So there's other resources out there to help with high water vehicles for training, for equipment. There's grants out there. It doesn't have to necessarily be for law enforcement. We could focus on getting grants for high water vehicles. That'll save money that we could spend on law enforcement functions. So there's a lot of grants out there. I'm not opposed to it. Of course, it's going to uh, we, we, it's gonna be a need. I'm not going to get it and have it stored there and it's going right. to go to waste because it's not being used. So, I mean, one of the sort of taglines of the show is, you know, current and future issues facing law enforcement. So what do you see? I mean, not just Precinct 2. I mean, you've been in law enforcement how many years now? 16 years. So 16 years. Yes. So uh, obviously we know things are always changing. we got to keep up with the time. So what do you see uh, that is currently a priority in law enforcement or future, I guess, things that we're going to have to address? Well, the main one for me is obviously, like I do now, is uh, active shooter training. I think it's, it's a hot topic. Uh, it, it hasn't necessarily affected our area, and it's not that we haven't. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen. So all our officers need to be prepared for that. Another one is cybersecurity. I know Precinct 3 already focuses on cyber forensics, but I want to focus on the, over, the you know credit card fraud, stuff like that that we see online already that sometimes ne doesn't necessarily get neglected. It just we don't have the officers who are trained and equipped to do that kind of stuff. So cybersecurity is a, is, is a fast-growing area that we as law enforcement have to adapt to. It, uh, so like I said, active shooter and cybersecurity would be the ones. So what is, what is your opinion on the current, um, I guess, technology conversation? Um, you know, we have LPR, spatial recognition, all the new technologies available to law enforcement versus the concerns over citizens' privacy. You know, um, one of the things I've always said, and we, de we deal with it in law enforcement, is sure. having body cams. A lot of officers, the older officers, are opposed to body cams. I'm not going to do anything that I, I'm going to be ashamed of on camera. I have no issues wearing a body cam. I never have. Uh, like I said, my undergrad, I had to write a paper on, on uh, that, type, that topic about facial recognition and citizen security or privacy. And my mentality is, is yes, there's going to be some security or privacy that we're going to have to give away to implement some of these stuff, but it doesn't have to be completely a complete intrusion into your life. You know, you already take a photo for your driver's license. You already take, you know, they already have your social security number. Stuff like that is nothing major. We're not going to look into your bank account. We just, it's for the safety of the people. And like I said, it's not going to be the the post 9-11, you know, every, everybody's getting tagged type of stuff. It's, we, it's for our benefit. I mean, it's I mean, public we, safety. We, we've seen in, in certain areas, 
uh, that uh, they've, as cities and otherwise, I think Shenandoah employs some, Sugarland employs some, has the LPRs, people coming and going, and, and people raise concerns that you don't need to really know when I'm coming and going, right? Now, uh, speaking from a law enforcement side, it's like, I don't care when you're coming or going either, right? right. I, I want to know when the crime occurred, who came and right. went, and, and that's, you know, the law enforcement side of it. Um, but obviously some of the grants you've talked about, some of the things that we can apply for and those type of things sort of enter into these areas. And, and obviously, you know, voters have expressed some concerns in uh, the fact that you don't need to know what I'm doing, right? So, I mean, how do you address that voter um, with the understanding of, you know, like I said, talking law enforcement, law enforcement, we understand. I, I don't have time to sit there and know when you're coming and going. And again, I could care less. Right. Um, but how do you make the voter feel with that? Well, we, we use the LPRs regularly in our daily function of running felony warrants. Without giving away too much, we, if we have a vehicle that somebody might be using, we tag it and we look to see where if it's been read so we could focus on areas that we might have to look for that person. Right. So we're not sitting there looking at all the LPR returns and seeing who, who left their house at what time. Like you said, I don't care. And most officers don't care. It's, there's a benefit to it, which is if we know the vehicle that was used in the crime or is being used by somebody who's we're looking for, we could determine what area they're in. You know, we, we, we hear stories where he, oh, he left the state, he's out of town, and then we get an LPR return of a car, and he's down South Houston somewhere, and it's like, okay, we've been lied to him. We know what area he's in. So it's a benefit to law enforcement. It's not, like you said, we don't care if what time you left to work, what time you're returning home. It, I'm not sitting there tagging cars just to see who's coming and going. We're looking for specific vehicles. So there's, a, there's, a, there's definitely a specialized need for them, and I believe we're using it for what it's worth now. I mean, I don't think we're using it for improper reasons of, you know, keeping track of the neighbor down the street. You know, the other uh, conversation or, or concern that's come up with, uh, it seems that we focus on narcotics, and we know why we do. Narcotics Correct. lead to so many different crimes. Uh, you know, they'll lead to your burglaries, to your robberies. I mean, when people want the drugs and they need the money for the drugs, many are willing to do anything to get Correct. those drugs, right? Uh, but of course, uh, we have been, uh, I say, criticized, challenged on the on the fact of uh, the asset forfeiture and those type of things, where uh, we're building a department uh, by these things, uh, and so the balance between that, uh, trying to balance providing the security, the safety to the neighborhood, removing the drugs and those type of things off of others' concern. Uh, for that. What are your thoughts? Well, we just had that question asked during our forum a couple of weeks ago, last week, and that was a hot topic even after on Facebook, some of the comments. We're not going in and taking people's law-abiding citizens' property. Right. These are criminals who who either gained the property, the, the financing, whatever it was, through some type of criminal enterprise. Those are the, the, the civil forfeitures we're going after. Right. We're not going to, you get a traffic ticket, we're not going after your property. If we could determine that you know, it was bought through drugs because you either had drug money on you or drugs, then that's a different story. But we're still going to go through the due process. We don't just sign a paper and you lose all your property. It's still a process we have to follow. Many agencies have benefited from this. You know, Montgomery County Sheriff's Office has benefited from it directly. I know we have, as a matter of fact, because on the SWAT team, we get equipment from it. Um, you know, so law enforcement benefits from it. It, it, hel it helps save the taxpayer's money because we don't have to raise taxes, we don't have to get extra funding from the commissioners when we could use some of this asset forfeiture to fund some of this equipment, vehicles, that law enforcement is in desperate need of. Well, and I think the general conversation is just the fact that it appears, whether it's the privacy, whether it's asset forfeiture, it's, it's all linked to me being a law-abiding citizen having something happen to me. Right. And I think it's sort of that education of... You know, it, it's not the it's not the excuse. A lot of people are like, well, if you don't break the law, this stuff won't happen. Well, yeah, that's to a point. Right. But it's more of the reality of the police that we know, and obviously it's just because we're in it and dealing with it, is uh, we're not targeting average citizens. These, these are the criminal element that we have seen that has benefited, that, you know, it, it's not for growing your department. It's for removing the infrastructure of a drug enterprise and, and keeping the citizens safe. Right. right. We have we have some officers, I mean, not, not officers, but some cases where they've gone after some assets and they can't get them because somebody else has a claim to them, banks and whatnot. So, I mean, it's not just we're going to take it all just because we can, because we can't just take it all. We have to have a reason for it, like you said. 
So now we, we have other people in this race. Correct. So obviously, and everybody's in law enforcement. Uh, everyone has some years of experience, those type of things. So um, not so much as far as personality. I think all y'all are great guys, but what specific do you bring to the table that you think the others don't? Well, I think my experience, uh, you look at my training record and my education. Uh, if I'm, I'm not, I might be going out too far here and say that I don't think either one of them has a degree. I have my master's degree. You know, I've worked in law enforcement while it's going to school. So I, my commitment to not only to myself, but to the community. And everything I've done, you can focus, has been through my education, for the county, for law enforcement. So my experience and my training, i have well versed in disaster management. Uh, like I said, my undergrad and my, my master's is in that. And Precinct 2 has been hit hard. It's one of the hardest hit areas for uh, so, national disasters. So the question that would come up is, should that or is that your responsibility versus, um, you know, our, not Homeland Security, but our emergency management, right. right? Our emergency management handles that. So how does the constable, how is that important to the constable's office to handle, right? Well, most uh, oh, in, in the disaster, they, they stand up the emergency management, their uh, dispatch. So they go out there, and they're supposed to be a department head, department head of each agency there, helping coordinate the recovery and, and uh, response effort in these areas. So having somebody there well-versed in it will benefit the area. It's going to get the, the right equipment, equipment needed in the right amount of time in the right place. And like I said, knowing how to do this, I could pre-plan and get vehicles that not only would benefit the sheriff's office because we, I mean, now if you think about it, sheriff's office and OEM are the, the primary responding agencies. And why does Precinct 2 have to wait just for the SO? Why can't the constables, you know, in a disaster take lead as well and help focus in certain areas? So what do you think a solution, because obviously it has, it's been hit over and over and over. If you lived in Montgomery County, River Plantation, we know it floods, right? right. I mean, if, if a storm's right. coming of substantial, right. you know, then, then it's going to flood. What do you think the solution uh, for that area is? Keep the dam closed in Lake Conroe. I mean, that's pretty much what caused it last time. Um, you know, FEMA's come in and uh, they've bought out certain houses that are prone to flooding in flood areas. So keeping those obviously... Uh, vacant and not building on will keep those areas people safe that you know they're not building houses in those areas anymore uh, magnolia bend has been hit hard you can't build anything there anymore because of the flooding so i think uh, obviously uh, educating the people in the community of these areas some people want to go in rp's great community it's a lovely community uh, certain areas flood not all of it but a lot of people don't know that they just think river plantation oh it's all underwater and it's not so educating the the citizens of where and where it's a good area to live in and um, keeping them safe and you know communication with OEM so and you have a, a new development that's right across there the um, the Grand, the Grand Central Grand, Park. Grand Central Park Correct. that's all coming in yes. and uh, obviously uh, that's going to be an added uh, area that uh, you would need to take care of or patrol I mean obviously it's it's Conroe right Correct. I mean so it's Conroe's area, and that goes back to that working relationship. How do you feel that area growing is going to affect your office? Well, obviously, it's uh, I think it's the newer community, so a lot of these people are moving in from out of county. So, you know, they don't know who, who the, the, the incumbent is. They don't know me. They don't know any of the candidates. So we have to inform them of who we are so that way they could make a, an educated vote instead of just being the old, oh, I know that name type of vote. So that will obviously bring in – you know, it's going to benefit them that way, getting the right person in the right spot. Well, and I totally agree, and that's why we're doing this is to educate the voter. I think it's very important for our voters to get out there and learn about the candidates. Uh, as I said, any candidate I've ever talked to, uh, they just want a conversation. You know, at the end of it, if they don't agree with you, then that's fine, but at least you had an opportunity to talk to them, Correct. right? So uh, the, uh, you know, sort of uh, wrapping up here, you know, the one thing that I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, to, to speak basically to the voter and in and, and general um, what plans you have and, and what uh, you would like to do to overcome areas that, I mean, our weaknesses, I mean, we acknowledge that, I mean, there's things we can improve in, things that we excel in uh, that are benefit. But uh, uh, tell us what, uh, basically, why someone uh, should be picking you out of the others and what information you really want the voter to have about you. Well, like I said earlier, my experience and my, uh, my education, I haven't just focused on, you know, one side of the railroad tracks. I focus on all. I uh, active shooter training. I do a lot of classes with Montgomery County Public Health. 
we do them in Spanish. I've offered active shooter classes in Spanish. Yes, some people might argue the whole immigration, build a wall thing, but in reality, everybody should feel safe wherever they are. So some communities get neglected. You know, so I focus on all communities. Yes, you know, I, it's public safety. We're all, we got into law enforcement to protect everybody, not protect a certain person or a certain party or a certain area of the community. We got in for public safety. And I want to focus on that. I want to bring everybody together, feel everybody has a voice in the race, and let them know that we're not here to protect, you know, one side. We're here to protect everybody. So with my experience and my training, I think I've, I've shown that. You know, I continue, like I said, I continue to do different security uh, initiatives in the county. You know, I did the, the court security here, a huge uh, infrastructure assessment of the court security here in the county downtown. So it helped everybody who comes to downtown, not just the courts the entire downtown area. So I think if they go out, take the time, look at my uh, my Facebook page, take the time to research my my background and my experience, they'll see that I'm, I'm, I'm the best candidate there is out there, you know, well-versed with training and education. So if someone wanted to contact you as far as having questions that they feel that they needed further information for, how would they do that? They could go to my Facebook page, uh, Pena for Constable, or my uh, campaign page, which is Pena for Precinct 2 Constable. They could go to either one of those two pages, and uh, there's links with my email there. Now, I do believe our, our producer has added uh, those links on our Facebook for both the candidates that we talked to today, uh, the incumbent and uh, candidate Daniel. So uh, if you want more information, and certainly, as I said in the beginning, the, the main purpose of this is to just have the information. However you vote is your business. Whatever your values are is your business. But it's actually just being the informed voter to go out there and actually make a difference in, in your vote. Thank you. So, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for coming in. We appreciate you your time today. Thanks for having me, and uh, thank you.